Hi, Ray Moran with the IIBB, here today with Ron Senior, Managing Partner with Senior Gustafson, an accounting and advisory firm based in Colorado, and we're lucky as Ron is an expert in the valuation of cannabis, and he's here to talk about his experiences and what's happening uh, today. Uh, Ron, can you give us a bit of background, rather a bit of uh, information on your background and uh, what your firm does? Happy to, Ray. Uh, I'm privileged to, to be part of this uh, series that you're producing. Uh, I'm a CPA licensed in Colorado, have been licensed here since 1981. Founder of a CPA firm that's in western uh, suburb of Denver. Uh, I've been doing valuation work for over 30 years. Uh, I testify regularly and, and the valuation work we've done has covered a wide spectrum from feedlots to, to auto dealerships to e-stops and dental practices and beyond and and uh in just when i thought i'd seen it all along comes cannabis and being in denver it's kind of one of the epicenters of where we first got legal and it's always good to say state legal regulated cannabis everything i'm talking about all the work we do is with state legal regulated cannabis versus the illicit side of the market which is is thriving uh, and it's alive and well but so you know the work we do and the clients are are all state legal now different states different rules different jurisdictions that all comes into play but i also have to mention that i i grew up in the 60s and 70s in ann arbor michigan i'm a michigan wolverine and a michigan state spartan and and I, I grew up about 10 miles from Ann Arbor. So I feel like cannabis is in my DNA because of just what happened during the Vietnam War and the war protests and marijuana. If, if anybody goes back and knows the history of John Sinclair on the Michigan Diag, uh, you know, I, I won't go into that story, but it's, it's kind of in my DNA. But uh, so doing valuation, uh, being in Denver, uh, along comes one of my longtime uh, tax clients, a golf buddy from my country club, that called and said, this was 2009, said, Ron, my neighbor wants me to buy into his marijuana dispensary. If I do that, will you help, help me stay out of trouble? So I hung up the phone, went talk to my two partners, and then I called uh, Mary Medley, the CEO of the Colorado Society of CPAs, because back then it's like, ooh, should I be doing this? because still under the uh, Controlled Substance Act that was passed in 1970 at the behest of Richard Nixon, it's still illegal federally uh, and remains illegal federally. And if you are, you can be accused of aiding and abetting uh, under the Controlled Substance Act because it's an illegal activity federally. Now, we've talked about this, that horse has left the barn. When I say we've talked about it at prior conferences uh, and, and so forth that most people say no don't worry about that now that we have 19 states that recognize uh, recreational or adult use cannabis and 38 states that rec recognize medical cannabis uh, most people think that that horse has left the barn in terms of the the feds coming after us but if you know if there's a change in administration and you get a attorney general like jeff sessions under trump initially you know you it it, it makes you pause um so but we're having a blast doing what we do ray uh it's 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 an amazing area in valuation just because uh, of some of the nuances but i we helped our our client uh my tax client buy into his his uh, neighbor's dispensary he ended up buying out his neighbor and then expanding the operation to having four dispensaries and two cultivation facilities that we did all the tax uh, uh, for tax work for. Um, he ended up selling it. He kind of created a little brand and, and sold out at a good time. And now he's a he's a consultant to the industry. But uh, uh, so I continue to have a relationship with him, but he's no longer invested. But that's at least how I first got into it. And then people started saying, "Hey, you senior, you do a lot of valuation. Can you can you value our our cultivation license, or can you value this dispensary? Because we a lot of times it, you're kicking out bad actors. You know, on state legal, you gotta to be in the ownership group. You have to meet approval of the state regulators. And sometimes it, 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 if somebody has a peccadillo in their in their background, it's like we need to buy Joe out because he can't be on our license." or we're looking at selling or buying or, you know, or raising money, whatever it might be. 
those are the things that take us down the, the path of valuing cannabis licenses and, and, and business interests. Yeah, and it's fascinating because you're involved in so many issues, not just in Colorado, but nationally and internationally as well at the same time. And I won't ask you to comment on individual uh, engagements, but if you can give us a flavor, this is not just a domestic issue. It's clearly an international niche at the same time. Oh, yeah. Great question, Ray. We started out doing work here in our own backyard and, and uh, then we started getting engagements. I think my first non-Colorado engagement was uh, something in Nevada about Nevada license rights in, in Las Vegas and had to do with the regulators uh, granting additional licenses and the, the, the a lot of litigation over you know the, the, the dilution of the license rights because of the regulators stepping in and saying, oh, we're going to double the number of licenses available. Uh, we've done work in Oregon and Maryland and Michigan and New Mexico. New Mexico just went recreational as of the first of this year. So it's like what we call an emerging market because they're now they've had a little bit of medical, uh, but now recreational. So and it's interesting because we we've valued some license rights on the southern border of Colorado that have uh, most of their businesses come from south of the border. Uh, there's a little town called Trinidad, a unique uh, example of, it's a county of 15,000 people in the whole county, of which 9,000 are in the county seat called T Trinidad. It's 11 miles north of New Mexico. And this uh, county that has a, a total of 15,000 people has 26 open and operating recreational dispensaries because 90% of their business comes from uh, Santa Fe and Albuquerque and, and uh, I-40 that runs east and west, just, just south of the, the Colorado border. But now that, now that uh, New Mexico has recreational cannabis, the, the, all the dispensaries that have been making bank in Trinidad are not gonna do so well, so it creates valuation opportunities. You also mentioned uh, international stuff. This is not just a domestic issue. We've been um, on the edge of having an engagement in Panama where some folks uh, own uh, an island, a hundred acre island just off the coast of Panama City. And they're trying to get approval from the Panamanian government to create a, a cultivation facility on this island uh, that would export their product to Europe. Uh, uh, because Europe imports a lot of their, their cannabis uh, from Canada and other places. We've also got a damages engagement that we're on the front end of where we're likely going to be valuing license rights in Colombia, Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Jamaica uh, in terms of what were they worth at the time that you know there was alleged malfeasance and damages. So most of our work is domestic. Uh, start here in Colorado and we're we're in Michigan now and we're in Oregon and other states, but it's fascinating to see that, you know, there's there's definitely an international um, kind of thrust to to this industry as well. Yeah, and the size of the industry is enormous, Ron. Some of the charts you shared with me before, I think by 2025, retail sales alone are forecasted to be 25 billion and the total economic impact three times that amount. Yeah. And compare that to the, the wine industry is, I've seen estimates that it's about a 70 billion, this is domestic, uh, 70 billion dollar a year industry. The beer industry is about 110 billion. So you have cannabis approaching 25 to 30 billion, you know, 40% of the wine industry and, you know, a, a third of, of the beer industry. It's, there's, there's a lot of money uh, uh, in cannabis. Uh, and again, state legal regulated cannabis. Well, what are some of the hot and emerging issues that you see within this profession or this industry right now, Ron? Oh, uh, again, great question. Um, everybody's waiting for the feds to do something. There's been legislation passed in the House of Representatives multiple times that's gotten stalled uh, in the Senate. Uh, there now is a, a Senate uh, kind of omnibus bill that was uh, sponsored by uh, Chuck Schumer from New York, Cory Booker from New Jersey, and Ron Wyden from Oregon that uh, is stuck in committee, but uh, we've heard that if it ever gets to the Senate floor, it's likely to pass and it would, it would 
pretty much incorporate all the things that have already been passed in the House, including banking. There's a separate bill called Safe Banking that would allow legal federal banking and allow the big banks to come in. Um, and th that's being pushed kind of outside of the bigger legislation. Ed Perlmutter, who's the congressman from my district and somebody that I personally know, is the, is the lead sponsor of that in the House. And we're hearing right now that they've attached some, some veterans' rights to that bill. They're trying to figure out how to make it attractive enough in the Senate to maybe get that to the Senate floor before the other parts of federal legalization to allow banking uh, by giving like social equity preferences to veterans. Um, and, and a lot of people think that if, if safe banking was to pass, uh, legalizing federal banking and you'd see Chase and Wells Fargo get into it, that that might be kind of the, the tsunami that gets the rest of it kind of resolved. On the other, on the other hand, Ray, it's, you talk about a unique dynamic. A lot of people are like, be careful what you ask for, because the, this is kind of a cottage industry, if you will, with a lot of, you know, small players that are kind of protected because of the federal illegality. Um, now they're punished too because of uh, t the tax issues, the, the federal limitations on deducting expenses. But you know what many people think is once the feds legalize it, the big boys, the big boys and girls are going to come in. Whether that's Ambev or Amazon or you know Walmart, you know, and they're going to sweep up the industry, and it's it, it, the the little players are going to you know kind of be swept aside. So. Uh, that's kind of a, that's on the horizon of something that, you know, goes into our kind of analytical thinking of <laughs> what should the risk be? Uh, and boy, is that a wonderful lead in. And you were telling me about some of the uh, the location specific issues that you have to deal with in, in valuing these businesses. So every state legal business is subject to license uh, regulations in the particular state and in the particular municipality and the real battle lines now are often at the municipal level michigan for example the recreational uh about a year and a half ago um allowing uh, recreational cannabis we use the term recreational adult use interchangeably but only 300 of the roughly 1800 municipalities in michigan allow cannabis so even though it's state legal, you know, certain cities have said not in our backyard, like Detroit, largest city in Michigan, has been very slow to approve regulations at the Detroit city level to grant licenses. And a lot of that leads into another really interesting aspect of what kind of social equity preferences should be allowed if, if someone's going to apply for a license in Detroit you know, should they have to be a resident? Should we give preference to, you know, disadvantaged people? Should we give preference to veterans? Should we give preference to, to people that have had prior convictions on their record? You know, th th those are some of the social equity criteria that exist and are vastly different from, you know, state to state, municipality to municipality. So bringing it back to your question about location, when we're asked to value a, a license right, you know, we first say, well, where is that license? What state's it in? And then what's going on, you know, at the municipal level in that state? Uh, because the Colorado has roughly 600 recreational dispensary licenses. Um, Nevada has 64, you know, and they're about the same population. So a, a, a license in Nevada is worth, you know, 10, nine, eight million dollars a license in Colorado is worth maybe a half a million dollars. Wow, just an amazing amount of issues in there. And uh, I don't mean to ask you to talk about the entire topic, but we were briefly mentioning issues like uh, company specific risk premiums. And that must be just a fascinating analysis to go through and try and quantify that. It is, and so it's, it's a startup industry uh, in, in a federally illegal you know, space. So a lot of the work we do in, in market data is, you know, essentially non-existent. Um, sometimes you can find some market data to, to apply, but most of what we're doing is an income approach. 
where we're using a discounted future benefits method, off, often doing scenario analysis of, you know, how long will, you know, the, 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 there's something called the Internal Revenue Code Section 280E, which is the code section of the Internal Revenue Code that, that uh, disallows deductions at the federal level of anything other than direct cost of goods sold. So when we're applying a discounted future benefits method, sometimes we'll say, well, you know, the, the, and we have to tax affect the benefit stream. Um, we, we do it with and without 280E taxes going on forever. But then we have to look at all the risks uh, associated with the industry. Um, and we, we end up using on systematic risk um, uh, components that are well beyond anything that I've ever used in any of the other work I've done. Yeah, having an on systematic risk premium of 10, 15, 20% is not unusual whatsoever in the, you know, the discount rate development that we use when using a discounted future benefits method. I can understand. Well, I think our profession and our viewers are lucky that you're sharing some of the knowledge you've learned at several upcoming webinars and conferences. Can you mention where you'll be speaking or addressing this topic, Ron, so we can oh. let people know where to find this? Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, speaking on valuation um, at the ASA conference. That's with Lincoln, Lincoln Eckhart uh, in Tampa on uh, September 12th uh, is, is the date for that. So it's nice that I've got an opportunity with some of my colleagues to, to speak on valuing cannabis and all the, all the nuances uh, associated with it at these, uh, these venues. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to give a little plug for those. Oh, absolutely. It's such an amazingly fast growing industry niche for us. Uh, it's just great that uh, you're able to share some of this knowledge and uh, help people along that learning curve. This has been terrific. Thank you so much for your time. I will be listening to the webinar. I will see you at some of these conferences and I'm looking forward to it very much uh, to our audience. If you have questions, well, Ron will have answers. So please uh, drop them in the box and we'll get right back to you. Ron, thanks again. This has been terrific. Oh, thanks, Ray. This was this was fun to fun to produce with you.